Hello, son. Welcome to yet another horror night with your old Texas scare. Tonight, I'll tell you two stories that will make your spine tingle. Back in 1999, I used to work as a park ranger over at Yosemite National Park. It wasn't a job I ever really saw myself doing. The fact was that until I busted my knees and had to stop playing football, the NFL was all I ever dreamed of. I was obsessed. It was football in the morning, football in the afternoon. And at night, I used to dream of football. But like many young men's dreams, they turned out to be nothing but the stuff of pipes. I needed a job, I needed money, and I needed it fast. So when an uncle told me of an opening up at Yosemite for a park ranger, I jumped at the chance. He told me it was relatively easy work, mostly outdoors, and I could rely on it. As long as there was state funding, as long as there were still trees sprouting out of the ground, I'd always have work. So there I was. 23 years old, decked out in my park ranger's uniform, hiking through valleys and over hills, popping ibuprofen whenever my knees started to play up. I'd done the job for about two years in March of 99, and honestly, I'd grown to love it. Being out there meant being surrounded by nature on a daily basis. I mean, I'd see things weekly that wildlife photographers would give their left nuts to document. But I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd encounter the kind of thing I did on March 18, 1999. It's something that I've thought about almost every single day since something I can't ever get out of my mind, and something I don't think I ever will. And it started off a chain of events that I gradually became obsessed with and that have changed my life forever. It started with a call about a potential forest fire up. My boss called and told me a hiker had seen some smoke rising up through the trees up near a place called Long Cabin in Sonora County. I probably don't need to tell you that forest fires can be absolutely devastating to an area like Yosemite and are taken very, very seriously by us park rangers. Now y'all should know that Long Cabin isn't technically in our jurisdiction. It's actually closer to Stanislaus National Forest. But since there was no one up in that area to go check it out, my boss asked me to go check it out. My boss asked me to go check it out and call in the fire department if it was a serious threat. We get a good number of calls like this, and more often than not, it's just a family whose barbeque has gotten out of hand, or kids whose campfire is a little too big, so I agree to drive up there to check it out, as it was only a couple of hours' drive there and back. So after about an hour's drive, I arrive up at Long Barn, and I can see some black smoke rising up through the trees in the distance. This is unusual, as black smoke means it's not just wood burning, more like plastic or artificial fabrics. So it definitely wasn't wood burning. This is kind of a relief at first. It meant it wasn't an outright forest fire, but it did mean someone was burning something that was definitely not good for the environment. I park up as close as I can to the source of the smoke, then hike off through the trees, basically just following my nose as the smell of the burning plastics got stronger and stronger. Then I see it, a burned-out car abandoned among the trees, still kind of smoldering, but I guess the fire had been set at night and had mostly burned through before I got the call about it. My first thought was joyriders. Something as simple as car thieves that had bust into someone's vehicle, tore it up and down the quiet country roads up here, then just abandoned it and set it alight to cover up any evidence. Again, this is a pretty unusual crime out here in the sticks, and you can forgive me for associating that sort of wanton mischief with more urban areas. But then I started to smell something else among the smoke, something more like burning meat. I'm a huge barbeque guy myself, and I know what it smells like when you leave something on the grill for too long, like that acrid, charred stench that I know is going to lead to disappointment because I've messed up on some expensive tea, one, or whatever. Only, you're definitely not supposed to smell that coming off of a burning car, are you? And as you can imagine, I started to feel very, very uneasy about the whole thing. 
I circled the burned our vehicle, looking for signs of animal carcasses or, God forbid, human bodies that were in or around the vehicle, but saw nothing. I even checked under the car, but again, didn't see a thing. I pulled out my phone to get in touch with the Sonora County Sheriff, who said he'd send over a couple of guys to check the scene out within the next hour or so, but who also asked me to stick around so I could guide them in and show them exactly where the vehicle was. So, given the fact I had an hour or two to kill waiting for them, I went into the trunk of my truck, pulled out the little fire extinguisher stored back there, and proceeded to put out the few small fires still burning in and around the vehicle. I do so pretty effectively, but when I'm done and I notice there's still something smoldering in the trunk, smoke keeps seeping out of the cracks, and the more it does, the more I can smell that burning meat smell. That's when it really hit me. Something, or someone, was in that trunk. That's where the smell of was coming from. Waiting for those sheriff's deputies seemed like it took an eternity. Mainly because when they got there, I knew they'd be able to open that trunk, and I really didn't want to see what was inside. So they get there, I tell them what I suspect has happened, and what I suspect has happened, and what I suspect is in that trunk. One of the guys uses a crowbar to wrench the trunk open which was pretty easy considering the fire had warped the metal locks keeping it closed. But what we saw inside is something I saw over and over again in my nightmares for many nights to come. It was a mess of blackened, burned flesh and contorted limbs. The sight of it alone caused me to gag and retch, puking up my breakfast onto the forest floor. Even those deputies, hardened by years of witnessing violence and cruelty on a daily basis, had a hard time dealing with what they were seeing. One just leaned against a tree, mouth covered with a cloth rag he kept on him, probably for this exact reason, while the other called in the coroner to deal with the bodies. They told me I could make a move back to Yosemite whenever I was ready. And boy, was I ready. I got the hell out of there as soon as I was able to. From what I understand, the sheriff's deputies soon discovered that the two scorched bodies in the trunk of that burned-out vehicle were those of Carola's son and Silvina Palasso. The two women, along with Carolee's son's young daughter, Julie, had been missing since the previous February, when they were last sighted alive and well at the Cedar Lodge near Yosemite National Park. It was actually one of my colleagues over at the park that had been the last person to see them alive, and the whole thing had drawn national attention, landing them on the cover of People magazine when some journalist took an interest in the story. And I mean, it was a really interesting story, albeit a very morbid one. Curly's son's wallet had been found on a street in downtown Modesto, California three days after they had disappeared, and Julie Sun's body was found dumped in heavy underbrush by an overlook at the Don Pedro Reservoir, several miles from the logging trail where the car had been found. Her throat had been slit from ear to ear. Local sheriffs and the FBI initially focused their investigation on a group of meth heads up in Northern California who had previous convictions for stalking and assaulting lone groups of women. But all those leads were abandoned when a break in the case cast light on another suspect. Because the story doesn't end here. In fact, it got even worse for all of us that worked up in Yosemite. One of the staff members at the Yosemite Institute was a young woman named Joey Ruth Armstrong. Joey was friendly, bubbly, and generally just a joy to be around. I'd only ever met her once or twice in my time as a park ranger but I could see why she was a popular member of the team. She loved nature, and she loved nature, and she loved her job, even more passionately than most others on our staff. But in July of that same year, 1999, Joey had made plans to spend a weekend visiting friends down in Sausalito. Team members who lived in the log cabin she shared with them in Yosemite Village said their goodbyes wished her safe travels, and watched as she wandered off among the trees to catch a ride down to Sausalito. But a few days later, when she was due to return to the village, she didn't show up. She'd actually left some contact details with the team, just in case they needed to talk to her, but 
When they followed up with a call to check up on her, her friends told them she hadn't actually arrived to spend the weekend with them, and that they were starting to get worried. A group of rangers went over to the cabin she stayed at, only to find her white pickup truck was still parked in the driveway, packed with luggage for her trip. Having decided to begin their search in the immediate area, the rangers split up into smaller groups. They trudged through dense brush, watching for rattlesnakes and looking for signs of their missing co-worker. Then, after only a short while of searching, they apparently spotted footprints, broken saplings, trampled ferns and grass. All signs that someone had recently ran or perhaps even been chases. That's when one of the rangers noticed something metallic glinting in the sunlight just a few feet away. It was a key ring lying in a shallow ditch. It was the sighting of this key ring that led them to spot something else. It was a dead body. It had on the white t-shirt and blue jeans that Joy had been wearing the day she left for society. Except now they were filthy, dirty, and crusted and blood-stained. But despite bearing such similarities to our missing co-workers, it was impossible to immediately identify the body. That was because whoever had killed this person had also taken the time to cut off the head, decapitating it completely. For those of us that worked in and around Yosemite, Joey's murder meant that the nightmare of the those burned bodies the nightmare we'd all tried to forget about, had come back with a vengeance. The killings were made even more disturbing to us by just how rare it was for anything like that to happen in this area of California. According to one of the older rangers, the last known murder to occur inside Yosemite's boundaries happened 12 years earlier, in 1987, when a guy pushed his wife off a cliff in order to collect on a life insurance policy. As you can tell, I've thought about this whole thing and researched the various murders a whole lot. And I've discovered that the chances of being murdered in one of our nation's national parks is about one in 20 million. Basically, you have more chance of drowning in your own bathtub, so please don't think this is an actual thing. People don't just hang around in the woods waiting to ambush unwary hikers. In the months that had followed the discovery of those burned bodies in the trunk of the car, the cops had almost no luck in finding a suspect. And honestly, we didn't expect Joey's murder to be any different. But unbelievably, in the immediate aftermath of her killing, local authorities got lucky thanks to a witness statement given by one of our co-workers. They had noticed a blue and white 1979 International Scout parked near Joey's cabin on the night of her death, and the cops put out an ab on it right away. Then a few days later on, two park rangers spotted a vehicle that looked remarkably similar parked on the shoulder of a highway not too far away. What happened next was truly bizarre. I spoke to the guys who found the truck, who said they searched around it for a while until they came across a guy sunbathing, completely naked, at a nearby river bank. They asked who he was, and he told them he was a handyman at the Cedar Lodge, some vacation homes built close by, and that his name was Kerry Stainer. The guy seemed kind of embarrassed that he'd been caught in the nude like that and quickly left the area. But my co-workers immediately called the encounter into local cops, who showed up and compared the tire tacks left by the truck to those left at the scene of Joey's murder. They came back as exactly identical. A few days later, the same weird guy was taken into custody while he was visiting some nudist resort over near Sacramento. When they took him into custody and interviewed him regarding Joey's murder, he confessed. Just straight up confessed then also confessed to the fact that he'd murdered Carollo's son, Silvina Palazzo, as well as Caroli's daughter, Julie. The FBI were called in for additional questioning, and it was then that Kerry Stainer told them all about how he had fantasized about hurting women ever since he was a child and how he had been completely unable to silence the voices in his head that told him to kill them. For five whole months, this absolute psychopath had been living right under our goddamn noses, hiding in plain sight. He'd been chilling up at Cedar Lodge, doing his job, and eyeing up potential victims under the pretense of being a friendly, albeit a little cookie, local handyman. 
From what I can gather, no one had suspected him of having anything to do with the disappearances of Sander Palazzo because he just seemed way too nice. Too much of a regular dude that, in the Steiner family name, had been in the news before, for a reason that led investigators to believe that there was no way that Carey had it in him to do something so terrible. You see, many years before, when Carey was just 11 years old, his younger brother, seven-year-old Stephen, disappeared without a trace one afternoon while walking home from school on his own. This devastated the family, causing a huge rift between Carrie and his dad. Eventually, Stephen escaped captivity after seven long years as the sex slave of Kenneth Parnell, a convicted pedophile and former employee of the Yosemite Lodge inside the National Park. He became a celebrity of sorts. There was national newspaper and television coverage, as well as a book and a TV miniseries chronicling his years of abuse. Whether or not that whole thing shaped Carrie into the violent psychopath he eventually became is something I don't think anyone will be able to properly determine. But shortly after, Carrie began to claim he'd seen Bigfoot. Yes, the ape, man-thing that's said to inhabit the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was well on his way to be being completely detached from reality. At his trial in 2002, Carrie Stainer pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, his lawyers asserted that the entire Stainer family had a history of sexual abuse and mental illness, manifesting itself not only in the murders, but also his obsessive compulsive disorder, his obsession with cryptids, specifically Bigfoot, and his request to be provided with obscene images in return for his eventual confession. He was nevertheless found sane and convicted of four counts of first-degree murder by a jury on August 27, 2002. The court then had to decide if he would be executed for his crimes, which it unanimously decided that he should, and rightly so. Stainer remains on death row as of September 2019, but problems with California death penalty laws are frustrating the process and it's becoming increasingly unlikely that Carey will suffer the same fate as his many victims. I know this was an overly long post, but as I'm sure you can all understand, this is something I've been quite frankly obsessed about since the discovery of those burned bodies affected me to personally. I'm actually considering writing a book about the whole thing, and my experiences living and working in the places that most of these crimes occurred. If I can't ever get these things out of my head, why not try and turn the whole thing into a kind of therapy? Turn it into something that others can enjoy and maybe something I can make a few bucks out of. Even if that does make me feel like a goddamn vampire profiting off of other people. Misery. Maybe let me know in the comments section, but regardless, I hope you enjoyed reading this, and maybe, just maybe, it'll help you stay safe in a world where people are out there with the word compulsions imaginable driving them to kill. It was an amazing day. Hell, it had been an amazing week. I was finally off from work in my little mini. Vacation was starting. I had been keeping track of the weather and made sure that the days I wanted to go on vacation would be great for some hiking and camping. I live in Altoona, Pa, in the middle of the state. My role in life is to explore every state park in Pennsylvania. I decided that when I was a youngin, I would make it my life's goal to visit and write about every park I could travel to I'm a young man, and as long as I stayed healthy and strong, I should be able to do it. There are 111 state parks in Pennsylvania, 20 state forests, one national forest, one national forest, one national memorial, two national historic sites, and three national historic parks. I've been to half of the state forests, and 30 of the state parks. I usually start at the parks on the outside of the state and work clockwise from Altoona as the six o'clock position, but I have a friend who loves Black Machannon State Park and she's always talking about how good the fishing is on the lake. She raves about the hiking and the trails and even though it's close to a highway, it's secluded enough to feel like you're in a world of your own, which is what I needed. 
I work at a Wawa, and I kind of hit the lottery for a decent amount of money. Not enough to retire, but enough to retire, but enough to afford my condo, keep up the hole, and go on vacation when I wanted to, which is what I'm doing now. So here we are. I'm going to head up to Moshannon and see what the fuss is all about. I woke up about 5.30 and finished loading up the car. I got some breakfast from the job and headed up Highway 99, then cut over to Alternate 220, then onto Beaver Road, as that would take me right into the middle of Black Moshannon, past the lake and to the camping grounds. Since the deer season was ending, the park's traffic would primarily be locals and the rare tourists. I got there by quarter to ten. The sun was high and the air was cooler than average for August. It felt great, good enough for a hike. After setting up camp and securing the site with a few locks, I put on my hiking gear and decided to take a few of the off-brand trails heading north. I passed the bog near Route 504. The panorama was amazing as the sun glistened off the waters by the banks, which were covered in oak, cherry, and pine trees, trees that rose up the gentle slope of hills. I took in the fresh scent and decided after the hike, I'd do lunch then get in some fishing. I hadn't seen a soul up here yet outside of some cars on the road coming in and the park ranger who guided me to my camping lot. It was about 40 minutes into my hike when I had come across anything odd. I had taken pictures of some of the birds I saw and decided to make a mental note of the varieties I'd seen. There were warblers, teals, black ducks, Canadian geese, and other avian critters. As I crossed over smaller bog path, I noticed a group of woodpeckers chasing a flying squirrel. Poor little critter, I said aloud to no one as I watched the aerial spat. Then a plane flew overhead, reminding me that no matter how far I go, civilization was. Um, what's that? I noted as I heard some crunching in the grass. I noticed the chittering of the critters had moved on as they continued their conflict. I knew black bears were native to this area, so I wanted to make sure there was a good bit of distance between me and it, just in case it decided to charge. I followed the noise of the crunching up the hill and into a nearby clearing. Moving slowly is not to startle the bear. Hell, it might not even be a bear, I thought, but deer or something else. It was neither. It was just another hiker like myself. Well, I guessed she was a hiker, but she didn't dress like one. It was a young black girl, probably late twenties, a few years older than myself, I thought. She had on a tank top with some bike shorts and sneakers. It was kind of odd, as it was unseasonably cool. It was probably around fifty degrees or so, maybe a little warmer, in the sunlight. She was carrying only one of those small backpack purses. She was very carefree as she walked, humming a tune and swinging the pack about as she played with the fauna. She walked to a grouping of stones and found a small tree stump and sat down. She gazed up at the sky and smiled. Damn, she was cute, I thought, as she looked about. Her hair was short and styled, high cheeks, nice patty lips. With a fit, athletic body, maybe only a few inches shorter than me. She pulled the pack to the front and looked inside. I guess to make sure she had what she needed out here, like keys or mace or something. I thought it would be courteous to at least let her know I was out here so as not to startle her. But just as I decided to not come across as a creeper looking at a chick in the woods, I felt the air temperature just drop. I shook for a quick moment as a chill went down my spine. Who? Shit! I said aloud, but not loud enough for her to hear me as I shivered. Must have been a breeze or something, I said to myself, rubbing my arms. As I gathered myself, I noticed the sky was almost imperceptibly darker. I mean, the sun was still out, and the sky is mostly clear, but it was almost like looking at the world through barely tinted sunglasses, which I was not wearing. I started making my way to her, and then I noticed her left hand. She was holding up her index finger. It, it, it was pointed in my direction. Had she seen me? There was no way. I was in the tree land, covered in shadow, and making my way around the bushes. She probably heard me curse, and, What the F? I cried as the chill returned with no breeze at all. I looked about frightened for some reason. I didn't know why. But I was scared as hell. I looked towards the girl. I had to warn her. 
But warner of what? Me being scared shitless for no reason. Then I noticed her finger still up, but pointing directly at me, then wagging at me. Then wagging at me. Like, don't come here, stay put, stay where I was. Confused, I decided to see what? Holy ah! I whispered to myself as I looked at her. Behind her. Behind her. What the hell is that? I tried to scream, but my voice died out as my eyes went wide with terror, as she just sat there not seeing the thing behind her. I tried to run, but like my voice, my legs didn't want to work. I could only watch in horror as the creature slithered much like a snake as it approached her. It rose behind her, its form like a dark wispy, ripped overly large and long cloak. It was a cloak of floating darkness. The bottom and arms were just like shredded bed sheets draped over a corpse, as the only true feature on it was the bony deer-like antlers on its hooded and skeletal face. Moss, grass, and other detritus dangled loosely from its antlers. The skeletal face was human, but overly large, and its mouth a gaping pit of darkness, as was its eyeless pits. A crack ran from its temple into the darkness of the hood. It reached for the girl as a pack dangled from her shoulder. No, it reached for the backpack, the shredded, handless hem of where its arm should be gingerly reached for it. I wet myself as I knew that thing would kill her, and she'd never even know it. I guess it was a blessing to die swiftly, but if it had seen me, I'd know how I would die. Death under a cloudless, sunny day, with the sounds of the woods to muffle my death cries, as the animals went about their days like this was normal. To my shock, the girl pulled the backpack over her shoulder and craned her head to look behind her. You remember how you got that crease on that bony face of yours, right? She said to it with little emotion. Ah, yes, it said, raising its sleeved arm to its head. You, Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia, assaulted me without provocation, I remember. You did try to suck the life from me, if I remember correctly. She said back to the thing as if they had some rivalry or something. Did you get the items per my request? The creature said as it floated to the front to face her as it towered over the sitting woman. The bottom of its smoke, like forms, swayed silently about a foot off the ground. But had it been touching the ground, it would probably still be at least ten feet tall. It glanced down at her. May I see it? To be sure, it is what I asked for. The demonic specter hissed in its airy breath. The girl looked to the backpack and reached inside. I could feel my legs quivering as I was both fascinated and terrified at the sight before me. My brain desperately tried to understand this whole thing. A human girl is having a conversation with some ghostly monstrosity. It's sunny and cloudless, and the sounds of the forest went on as normal. I think I even heard another plane overhead as my nose took in the smell of my urine, and my weak knees marinated in the stuff, too shaken to do anything else. I watched on as the girl pulled something from the bag. It looked like a brass cup and a medallion. The creature hissed in pleasure as it rose above her, its arms fluttering like some damned bird before it settled down again. This what you mean, the girl said dangling the medallion and holding the brass cup before it. The creature shrunk towards the ground in an almost kneeling position. As it did so, the front of its ethereal body began to glow in a small circular pattern about the size of the medallion. Do you also have the other thing, it said excitedly. Its antlered head moving forward, trying to look in the pack, she pulled it back and told it to. Take it easy, she told it annoyed at the thing's eagerness. How long has it been? She asked it as she pulled forth another cup and a small bottle or something. The creature rose up and back as the light in the medallion dimmed some. It looked as if it was in contemplation. What human year is this now? It asked. 2019 of the common era. She told it, 374 of your years since I lost that. It growled, pointing to the medallion and the brass cup. Name your fee and let's be on with it. It stated, the eagerness overriding its common sense, as its formless body shuddered in anticipation. I told you my fee when you made the request. The crack on the head knocked away some of your memory, she asked it, tapping her head. Are you serious? That was your fee? 
Not power or influence, or money as you humans love so much. Not adoration or some silly bargain. It said to her almost incredulously, A story, a story, she stated with a wide grin on her face. A story, I said to myself. Why something so small? Why not something of significance? The creature asked her. I too was curious about this, because my job is to collect the history of as many things as I can. I'm also a sucker for a good story. Stories are significant. I know somewhere in that spectral skull of yours you've seen and done some shit. Just tell me one, she said, holding up a finger. You are very curious for a human Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia. It replied to her. How long have you been around? She asked the thing. Thousands of your years. Why? Tell me a story of something. Eight hundred? No. One thousand years back. She stated as she placed her elbows on her knees and cupped her face like a damn kid at camp around a campfire. She even had the silliest damn grin on her face. Who was she? How could she? That was she sit around that thing like it was normal. I hadn't realized it, but I found myself sitting also on a dry patch of the ground looking on intensely. I must be suffering from brain damage or something. Fear mixed with intrigue, mixed with intrigue, mixed with heightened curiosity. I, too, waited for the story of the thing. Very well, curious one. The story I will tell you is of a really stupid boy. In his equally stupid family, the creature began.